tonight on the food hospital, a young man whose life is blighted by extreme acne. I've heard people talking about me saying, have you seen that guy's face? They'll just say like abusive things. A woman who hasn't had a full night's sleep in 30 years. In a week, I would get an average of 11 or 12 hours sleep for the whole week, and a bad night can be nothing. And a cola addict whose six litre a day habit is putting a strain on her body. You're about 50% made of fat. Absolutely disgusting. Dr Pixie McKenna finds out how turmeric could be a weapon in the fight against cancer. The engine gold, they call it. Engine gold. And the food hospital experts reveal what our we could tell us about our health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got a little walk there. <laughs> This week's first patient is a teenager with a severe skin problem that devastates the lives of thousands of young adults. I'm Adam Davis, 18, from Hayes, West London, and I have acne. Acne is a skin condition that causes spots ranging from tiny, painless whiteheads to large, angry red cysts. I've had it for about four or five years now. Sometimes I'll get, like, full lumps on my face, and they can be painful, really red, and it's just horrible. Some mornings I'll wake up and my pillow will just be stained with blood. Acne is very common during puberty, although fewer than 20% of sufferers get it this badly. It just affects my confidence. On occasions it stopped me from going out if, the, if they've been like really bad. I've heard people talking about me like saying, have you seen that guy's face? They'll just say like abusive things. It can be quite demoralizing. Adam's been prescribed a variety of pills and lotions to treat his spots, but so far, nothing seems to be working. So he's come to see GP Gio Maletto, who wants to take a closer look at his skin. What we've got here is something called a skin scope, which is a microscope, but it also does an analysis of the kind of shape of your skin, uh, the pores and that sort of thing. Let's move it around a little bit. So there, that's obviously a pustule <laughs> uh, in glorious close-up. Yeah, it's, it's horrible to look at. It kind of highlights how bad it is on my face and, I don't know, that sort of emphasises what other people think of me in my eyes. Gio wants to bust some of the myths about acne. So have you heard any stories, you got any ideas about what you think causes it? Some people talk about, like, junk food being related to it, so greasy, greasiness and affecting the skin, and other people say, like, it's because of like just not washing well enough. Yeah, yeah, and they are a total myth. There's no link between greasy food or chocolate's another one, or being in any way sort of unclean. Okay. Um, what you have is acne vulgaris, which affects predominantly the face. And the reason it affects you know up to 85% of teenagers and young adults is because it is dependent on the presence of androgens. Most of us suffer from acne during puberty, when our bodies produce a surge of hormones called androgens. This includes testosterone, which stimulates the sebaceous glands in the skin to release an oily secretion called sebum. If there is too much sebum, it can clog up your skin, and when it mixes with bacteria and dead skin cells, it causes acne. Now, there is some evidence that shows that insulin can stimulate the production of androgens. So by evening out your, your um, insulin levels, we hope to try and limit that stimulation of growth. When we eat, insulin acts like a key, opening up cells so they can take in sugar to use as an energy source. If Adam's current diet is causing too much insulin production, then he must change the way he eats. So it's over to dietitian Lucy Jones. First, she finds out what he normally eats. Ready-made pasta. OK. Another ready meal. I take it you're a keen I am a pasta, pasta fan, yes. Like many teenagers, Adam's diet includes a lot of convenience foods, but many are full of refined carbohydrates. Because these are quickly broken down by the body, they cause a spike in blood sugar, which raises insulin levels. OK, sausage rolls. And so Lucy devises a strategy to change his dietary habits. What we're actually going to set you on is a low GI plan. Um, the GI stands for glycemic index. 
the foods on the low GI diet will be broken down more slowly and should lead to lower insulin production. Less insulin can lead to less androgen, which should mean less acne. Well, the good news is that pasta can be on your plan. That's good. <laughs> what I will want you to do is possibly swap to whole grain pasta. That's fine, I like whole grain pasta. Oh, that's brilliant. We also want to move you away from a lot of the refined sugars, particularly things like sugar sweetened soft drinks and cereals, which tend to have a lot of added sugar in. Okay. What would be an okay compromise? Do you like porridge at all? No. Muesli? I've never tried muesli porridge. Oh, you can add in loads of stuff to that, like nuts and seeds and fruits and... I don't like nuts. Okay, we'll leave out the nuts. Lucy takes Adam through a quick, easy lunch option. Grab yourself a pitta. Cut it open. This is olive-based bread. It's fine for you to include healthy fats and they, again, will reduce the GI profile of that meal. A low GI diet isn't only beneficial to acne sufferers. By helping to control your appetite, it can also reduce the risk of getting heart disease and diabetes. Ideally, have three different colours of vegetables in your sandwich, which gives you a maximum amount of nutrients. OK. Because, actually, there's loads of nutrients that are required for good skin. How does the plan seem? You think it's going to be achievable? It's going to be quite a lot of like commitment, but it, it'll be worth it in the end, hopefully. Adam is pinning his hopes on this diet working so he can begin his adult life full of confidence. Today has helped me to sort of understand a little bit more about the causes of acne and I don't know if it's going to work, but it's something else to try and it's something else that, you know, I'm hoping will at least make some improvement, if not completely cure but we'll just have to wait and see. This series, The Food Hospital is out and about, putting the nation's diet under the microscope to find out what impact the food and drink we consume has on our health. And this week, we're talking urine. We all take a wee, flush it away and never think about it again but it can actually be very useful for telling us about what's happening inside us. To prove it, Lucy and Geo are at the Dingle Asparagus Farm in Worcestershire to examine the wee of 30 locals. Well, thank you to everybody for coming here today. Has everybody produced a sample for us? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Now, of course, we wouldn't be so mean to ask all you guys to produce a sample and us not participate. So, Geo? Right. <laughs> Lucy and Gio's samples are proof that what you eat can affect how your wee looks. Gio has delightfully gone and eaten a whole load of beetroot for us. Um, in about 14% of the population, when they eat too much beetroot, it gets filtered out and ends up in their wee. Now, my <laughs> fluorescent neon wee um, is because I have taken one of these high-strength B vitamin pills. And what happens is the B vitamins and the carotene go through and get filtered out through your kidneys and give you a lovely fluorescent neon wee. So if it gets dark and we haven't finished, <laughs> I'll be able to light us all up and we can see our way home. Beetroot and B vitamin aside, the colour of our wee acts as a very good barometer for monitoring our general health. Let's just have a look at the colour first of all, take a look and see what it looks like. Our group has produced a variety of colours. Not really, everyone looks quite clear, it's usually a good sign. Nice clear urine, see right through it, and various colours here. We've got a very pale one here, look at that. You just, you, you, uh, water in that. That's a cheat. Is that an actual wig? Right, we need to test it. In this lady's case, her clear urine is a result of drinking a lot of water. But in some cases, it could indicate diabetes, especially if you're having to go for a wee a lots of times each day. Diabetes originally means sweet urine, so that's how you used to diagnose it, dip a finger in it, and so you'll be doing that later. <laughs> Normal wee is yellow, but dark yellow indicates you're dehydrated and not drinking enough water. If you have dark brown wee, it could be a sign your liver's not functioning properly and you should consult your GP. And one bottle has caught the attention of eagle-eyed GP Geo. So there's one sample here that I've noticed that is a little bit uh, cloudy. Um, so whose does this belong to? Oh, well done, congratulations. Um, <laughs> you are a winner. Cloudy wee can be a sign of protein in the urine, perhaps caused by cystitis. This could be a urine infection. 
Okay, and to sort of confirm that, we'd need to send this sample to the lab to see if it grows any bacteria. Antibiotics can usually clear this up quickly, but if you don't get it seen to, it could lead to kidney problems. Who here eats asparagus? I should think so. We are in the heart of asparagus country. <laughs> Our volunteers have produced a wide-ranging spectrum of we, but we're going to show you that even when we eat the same food, our urine can be very different. <laughs> right, well, I can definitely smell... <laughs> <laughs> Asparagus. The food hospital doesn't just treat illnesses. It also treats extreme eaters, people whose weird dietary habits have left the medical team concerned for their health. Tonight, a young woman with a bizarre addiction she's desperate to kick. My name's Charlene, I'm 25 and I'm from Rockford in Essex, and I have a problem because I'm addicted to cola. Surprisingly, Charlene works as a healthcare assistant. She guzzles a shocking six litres of cola a day, using it as a substitute for food. The reason why I think I drink so much is because I get so thirsty and I'm really tired all the time from where you're running about. Good evening, Sahara B. I'm on my feet from the moment I start till the moment I go home. I drink more to keep me going. Pretty much the only food Charlene eats at work are crisps and sugary snacks, all washed down with yet more cola. I do not drink any water. Cola does everything I need it to do, like hydrating me, so I don't really need to drink water. At the food hospital, dietitian Lucy Jones wants Charlene to confront the enormity of her addiction. Charlene, what do you think we've got here? A lot of cola bottles. A lot of cola bottles, yeah. In its entirety, the snake represents about a month's worth of what you're drinking, which I have to say I found fairly shocking. It is when you see them lined up, yeah. Every day, Charlene is downing a health-wrecking amount of cola. Forget the food she's eating, this is what she's consuming just through what she drinks. Over 500 more calories than she needs in a day, a third more caffeine than is healthy, and a whacking 10 times the recommended daily amount of sugar. And what it means, in this month's worth, you're consuming the weight of a four-year-old child in sugar. Wow. To see what damage Charlene's cola addiction is doing, consultant surgeon Shaw Summers takes a body scan. The results are giving him cause for concern. You're about 50% made of fat, and oh. that's from all the sugar. Wow. And as a reference, you shouldn't be any more than about 20, 24%. How do you feel about that? I knew I was overweight, but to say it's 50% is a big shock. OK. If Charlene remains addicted to cola, she will become more obese and runs the risk of developing heart disease and diabetes. And it's not just cola. Many fizzy drinks on the market contain high levels of sugar, which will have the same effect if drunk in the same quantities. Shaw wants Charlene to kick her habit, but she's tried before and failed. The thing about cola, Charlene, is that it contains actually quite a lot of caffeine. The way caffeine works is it gets into the brain and it affects some chemicals called neurotransmitters and it makes you feel perky. When you come off caffeine, you get that real low, that sinking feeling where the chemicals that have been blocked out by the caffeine all come back into play and you start to feel low. So what we need to do is to design a diet that helps you come off the caffeine in the cola, reduce the sugar intake, and replace some of those neurotransmitter chemicals to make you feel well enough to keep going. Many other carbonated soft drinks also contain caffeine. Caffeine is a drug, so when we try to give it up, we experience unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. And in Charlene's case, as her daily caffeine intake is so high, she will find giving it up tough. 
cold turkey is going to be the only way because you can't, I don't think you can cut it down. It's just got a big cold turkey. In there the are some way. people who would say the best way is to cut it down bit by bit. But the danger with that is if you can't keep control of it, you just swing back the other way and you just reach for another bottle of cola. So it's your choice. What cold turkey is the way forward, I think. Cold turkey definitely. for you. OK. Consuming these kind of drinks in moderation is not a problem, but Charlene's intake is extreme. Charlene's consumption of cola is way out of control. When she showed me how much she drinks in a day, that really shocked me. We've got to do something quite drastic to get her off this, and I think cold turkey is the only way for her. Lucy has devised a diet plan to help break Charlene's addiction and cope with the withdrawal symptoms. She's banning Charlene from her current diet of cola, crisps and sugary snacks. So your cold turkey healthy eating plan is pretty much over there. We're going to get you eating all five food groups. That's going to be a bit novel for you. <laughs> yeah. But they constitute things like starchy carbohydrates. They're things that are going to release their energy slowly. So we're not going to have this constant hit of sugar and then dip and sugar and dip. We want to actually stabilise your blood glucose levels evenly by giving you small portions regularly through the day. This cold turkey diet is full of nutrient-rich meal options, but the key to its success is regular meal times. This will stop Charlene having dangerous sugar and caffeine cravings that will send her back to binging on cola. So how's it sounding? It sounds pretty good at the moment, yeah. Yeah? Good. Cold turkey's not looking so bad after all. It's not, exactly. Cold turkey can be tasty. <laughs> As Charlene's previous attempt to kick the cola failed, Lucy fires her up with a parting incentive. 12 bottles at £1.30 is actually over 15 quid, which is £109 a week, which is over five and a half grand in a year. Oh, my year. God. Almost a new car. That is! Actually, that's more than my car. <laughs> wow. And some really nice holidays. Oh, God. All the holidays that I'm missing out on just because I'm drinking cola. It could take up to two weeks of going cold turkey to beat Charlene's cola addiction, but can she stick to it? Today's been a really big eye-opener, massively. Every part of it has just really shocked me. and. If that ain't motivation to make me want to stop, then I don't know what is. Earlier, at the Dingle Asparagus Farm in Worcestershire, Lucy and Geo examined the urine health of 30 local volunteers. Now they're going to show how our urine is affected by our genes. Even if we eat the same foods, some of us produce different smelling wee. Our volunteers have enjoyed a hearty plate of asparagus and given another urine sample. So we have come to the point where we are going to test out who gets asparagus we. Careful with the liquid gold. <laughs> 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 and, and have a good smell of your urine. Is he... That's very powerful. The foul smell, a bit like rotten cabbage or ammonia, comes from the byproducts released when the digestive system breaks down a sulfur compound in the asparagus called methylmercaptan, the same compound found in the secretions of a skunk. The smell can reach your wee as quickly as 15 minutes after eating it. That's a vintage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got a little waft there. <laughs> but some of our volunteers' we, including Mr Asparagus's, doesn't have a foul smell. No, it doesn't smell today. <laughs> and that, scientists believe, is because they lack a particular enzyme that breaks the sulphur compound down. Those of you that can smell the cabbage type odour that you get after eating asparagus, if you can move yourselves over to this side, and for those of you that can't really smell any difference to how their wee normally smells, if you can move yourselves over there. Half the group can't smell asparagus. The other half, including Lucy and Geo, can. Um, so this is the smell group here, isn't it, who've uh, got a smell. But what we want to do is just to prove that I can actually smell it. Can I borrow your sample? 
Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Beware. Years of training. It's this. Horrible. Right. Well, I can definitely smell. <laughs> I, I told you, didn't I? Asparagus. You have obviously clearly produced a lot of the compound, so that's a very good example. But this is where genetics complicates things. Some people in the No Group will have produced asparagus wee, but won't be able to smell it. And research now suggests that this is because they lack a specific smell gene. This lady can't smell it, but can Geo. Right, that I can smell some asparagus. So, yeah, you can't smell it? No. Okay, well, that's interesting. So you produce the compound, but can't actually detect it. Scientists don't know why some people can't smell it. There's no known evolutionary reason. But regardless of your genetic makeup, there's plenty of good reasons to eat asparagus. Asparagus is a, a really good nutrient for potassium, which helps to regulate your blood pressure. As well as that, it's low in fat and sodium, so it's fantastic for anyone that has heart troubles or is concerned about the health of their heart. Asparagus is also a great source of vitamin A, dietary fibre and folic acid, which work together to help prevent cancer. It's also a fantastic source of iron, which is important for a healthy immune system. The bonus of asparagus is that it also contains vitamin C, so all round, a blooming good veg. So don't let the smell put you off. Twenty-five-year-old Charlene is addicted to cola and has been drinking up to six litres a day. But it's having a ruinous effect on her health, so she's decided to go cold turkey. This is the last bottle of cola left, and I don't feel tempted at the moment to drink it, but later on when I go out, I'll more than likely be tempted by the cola demon. <laughs> it's a good start. But by morning, Charlene's already starting to feel withdrawal symptoms. Last night was the first night of the diet, and it was really, really hard. I'm feeling really bad this morning. I've got a bad headache, quite tired as well. Didn't want to get up, and I'm really, really thirsty. I had a glass of water last night when I went to bed, but I didn't drink it all because it just didn't quench my thirst, and it was just pointless, really. The food hospital prescribed a nutrient-rich diet to counter her withdrawal from sugar and caffeine. But on day one, Charlene skips breakfast as usual. I always have sugar in my tea, yeah. Um, I'm tempted to put about five in there just to get a bit of a pick-me-up. She heads off to start a 12-hour shift on an empty stomach. If I'd had a, um, a cola today, I would have been a lot more energised and I'd be a lot more bubbly and ready and just all round happy that I've had my fix of, you know, my addiction. By not following her cold turkey food plan, Charlene is in danger of slipping back into her addiction. At the moment, it's really not easy, and I'm hoping it will get better. But at the moment, it's not easy. Cold turkey is hard work. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna. Throughout this series, I'll be trying to identify the real heroes of the food world. From a vegetable that can deliver some of the same blood thinning effects as aspirin, to a rehydration drink that comes straight from Mother Nature. This week I'm in Leicester to find out more about a spice most of us have in our kitchen cupboards, turmeric. Turmeric is a key ingredient in some of our favourite Indian curries. But this isn't why this magical spice has grabbed the attention of Dr Lynn Howells from the University of Leicester. She believes that turmeric may have the ability to take on one of our biggest killers, bowel cancer. Turmeric's been used in traditional Indian medicine for thousands of years, really, and we know the bowel cancer rates in South Asia are about three to five times lower than in the UK. What we see when um, immigrants come over to the UK, even after two to three generations of them living here, they still have far lower bowel cancer rates than the rest of the, the UK as a whole. 
Over 41,000 people are diagnosed each year with this deadly disease. That's one person every 15 minutes. Most cases occur in people over 50, but in the last 10 years, the rates of bowel cancer in the under 30s has risen a staggering 120%. Could it be possible that this spice could hold the key to fighting this disease? Dr. Howells wants to show me what her research has revealed so far. At Leicester University's Cancer Studies Lab, she extracts the active ingredient she's interested in, curcumin, from the roots of the turmeric plant. You can smell it, it's really, really mm, fragrant. Lovely. If you were to eat that neat, are you still getting the... The, the curcumin? Curcumin. Um, you don't have to eat an awful lot. Can I stand back? So this is liquid nitrogen, is it? Yeah, I'm just going to pour a little bit of that in it. It'll just freeze it and just make it easier to um, mash it all up. And curcumin is actually responsible for this really vibrant, lovely yellow colour of the turmeric. Amazing, yeah, amazing colour. The engine gold, they call it. Engine gold. Lynn is going to test this solution on human cancer cell cultures. As a doctor, I was amazed by what I saw next. Find out more later on. To help improve our bowel health generally, the Food Hospital is launching a fibre challenge to get more people paying attention to their poo. A diet high in fibre can reduce our risk of developing bowel cancer by up to 20%. And we've recruited 50 volunteers and asked them to record their progress. Melissa was only going for a poo once every four to five days, which is why she decided to take up the fibre challenge. She's now been on it for 10 days. For three tablespoons of sweet corn, two grams of fibre, so it's just a really, really simple way of adding more in. This is my bathroom, where all the toilet action happens, I suppose. It was a little bit weird to get up off the toilet without you know, wiping and pulling your knickers up and all that because you've got to see it. Probably the best part of it is noticing a difference in how I feel when I go to the toilet. It's been easier and always quicker. Next at the food hospital, a woman who fears the sun going down. I'm Ellie Target and I'm from Leominster in Herefordshire. I'm 60 years old and I suffer from insomnia uh, quite badly. I can't remember the last time I had a full night's sleep, probably about 30 years ago. 30% of people in the UK have had bouts of the sleep disorder insomnia. Symptoms include having difficulty getting to sleep or staying asleep. Ellie is falling well short of the six to eight hours a night that most of us need. In a week with insomnia, I, I would get an average of 11 or 12 hours sleep for the whole week, and a bad night can be nothing. No, uh, no sleep at all. In the daytime, Ellie feels irritable, tired, and finds it hard to concentrate. It also affects my motivation, so I do find it very difficult to get up and get going. And it also has caused depression in the past as well. She plays music to try and unwind and has also tried herbal remedies, hypnosis, self-help sleep tapes and acupuncture. Nothing's worked and three years ago, Ellie's GP prescribed her a short-term sleep management tablet. When I first started on those, I had lovely sleep. I could get four to six hours sleep a night, and that made a huge difference to me. But I've been on these pills now for three years, and the effect is beginning to wear off. And that's my big concern, is where do I go from here? And I feel drugs is not the way for me to go. It's, it's not the way to treat insomnia. So, after 30 years without a good night's sleep, can dietitian Lucy break this miserable affliction? Ellie, welcome to the food hospital. Thank you, thank you. It must be completely exhausting. 
I think you get past exhaustion actually and I think in the end you you just go on adrenaline it just it, there's something that just keeps you going so if, your your insomnia is you literally just can't get to sleep I can't get to sleep if I do get to sleep eventually it can take me five hours to get to sleep I can feel very sleepy and then I can drop off for 10 minutes and then I'm I'm up again I think it does become a phobia as well mm. that I'm I'm afraid of actually going to bed because I know that it's going to be useless. Yes. Ellie's problems began when she started working night shifts and after she had children. We need sleep to survive. And if you're surviving on very little, it has knock-on consequences all throughout your body. Ellie's already adopting several sleep-enhancing good habits. That's avoiding alcohol and smoking, no caffeine from four hours before bedtime, and no late-night spicy foods. But Lucy thinks she can do even more. A very high carbohydrate meal just four hours before bed releases lots of insulin. And insulin is the hormone which takes the sugar out of your blood and gives it to the cells. And a typical evening meal would probably be a big baked potato yeah. or a really big plate of white pasta or white basmati rice right. with a little bit of vegetables and salad, but not mm -hmm. a great deal of protein. There are other components that come in the rest of the day, though. So at breakfast and lunch, as well as having your healthy carbohydrates that we'd normally have, we're going to be having sources of a particular amino acid called tryptophan. Insulin helps the amino acid tryptophan to enter the brain. Tryptophan turns into serotonin, which in turn is converted into melatonin, the hormone which helps us go to sleep. When it gets dark outside at night, our body increases in melatonin and that helps us to feel sleepy. That's why dark is so important. Yeah. So having enough sources of tryptophan in the day is going to make sure there's enough of that to produce enough melatonin at night. Good sources of tryptophan include eggs, peanuts, cheese, fish, poultry, tofu and bananas. Lucy also has a suggestion for a sleep-inducing bedtime snack. There's actually been a recent study into eating kiwi fruits before bed. Kiwis contain serotonin, as well as folic acid and the antioxidant vitamin C, which combined, the study found, can encourage sleep. So what this study did was it took people struggling with their sleep and for four weeks got them to eat two kiwi fruits an hour before bed. Right, OK. And it found that it had quite a dramatic improvement in both the time it took to get to sleep and how long they stayed asleep. Wow. So I wish you all the best and oh, I really you. look forward to seeing if this has a positive impact on your sleep. Mm, thank you so much. <laughs> if it works, then it's going to just change my life completely. And, and I have high hopes actually because there was so much that Lucy's told me that I had no idea about with foods and, and what foods to eat when. And I can, I can see the point of it and I can see why I should be doing it. Ellie will return to the food hospital in five weeks' time. Four weeks ago, Adam came to the food hospital seeking help for his chronic acne. Lucy placed Adam on an eating plan to level out his insulin production to help control the amount of hormones he was producing. Now Lucy and Gio want to see if the low GI diet has had any effect on his spots. No way! It's fantastic. This was a picture of your skin last time you were here. How do you think it compares to now? Now's a lot better actually. Yeah, it is, isn't that. it? Yeah. It is a lot better. You've definitely got less pustules. Yeah. And the redness is, is, is down a little bit as well, I think. We've got the microscope here that we had a look at last time. Yeah. Let's take a look at your skin under the microscope. So if I put this up here, that is fairly impressive. Whereas before there was lots of sort of craters and yeah. raised areas. Here it's much more even. Mm. So how do you feel looking at that? It highlights that it has been a positive change, I guess. So how has student Adam been coping with the diet? <laughs> Tell us what sort of foods you have been picking. At home, it's changing breaded just for like plain, like chicken breast, for example, and then followed up with fresh fruit as well. I never used to eat fruit, really, 
but now I have something with every meal. What about things like if you're going out with your mates or whatever and, you know, sort of hit up a junk food? I've managed to sort of plan ahead and if I know I'm going to be out, take things out with me, sort of like ready-made foods that are going to fit in with the diet, like pizza breads and things like that. That's quite impressive. Does it make you feel deprived or righteous? Or a mixture of the two? <laughs> <laughs> Those are your only options. Either deprived or righteous. I guess a mixture of the two then, to be honest. <laughs> when I'm seeing myself every day, it's not a drastic change. But then when someone shows me how I was before I started the diet, it sort of really emphasises how much of a change it's been. That makes me feel good about it. Anything nutritional isn't instant. These things take time and I think, you know, your skin's responding beautifully to the changes in your eating and hopefully it will continue to improve. I was a bit impatient with it at first, but if like sort of it's changed this much in four weeks, then I can definitely see myself carrying on with it in the long term. Coming up, can this little fruit really hold the key to getting a good night's sleep? And did six-litre-a-day cola addict Charlene break her bad habit? Two months ago, 25-year-old Charlene from Essex came to the food hospital seeking help for her six-litre-a-day addiction to cola. She wanted to break her habit by going cold turkey. So Lucy devised a regular eating plan of nutrient-rich meals to help stave off her sugar and caffeine cravings. So Charlene, are you still drinking cola? Absolutely gone. Really? Yeah. Good girl. Don't drink any of it at all. Not Good a drop? Girl. Nothing at all. Point blank, nothing. Did you actually feel you were getting a withdrawal when you stopped the cola? I had really, really bad withdrawals. I had um, really bad headaches. Um, I had no energy at all and I was sleeping a lot and I was really moody. Has that made you realise how much the cola was in your system and absolutely upsetting it? Yeah, to go from all the headaches and the bad moods into how I'm feeling now, it just goes to show that how much it was having an effect on me. So how do you feel now? I feel a lot better now. Um, I've got a lot more energy and I just feel a lot brighter in myself that yeah, I'm kind of free from the cola, if that mm. makes sense. What are you replacing the cola with? Water and juice, actually. Good girl. That's really good. <laughs> I actually drink water. It seems like the stark warnings that Charlene was given about her health, if she continued to binge on cola, have hit home. So, what are you eating? I eat a lot of vegetables now um, and just healthy food, nothing with a lot of sugar in it or anything like that. No, no chocolate at all, really. How many meals a day? I have breakfast, um, yes, lunch, okay. and a dinner, so. Three meals a day? Yeah, three meals Going yeah. from practically nothing, really? And rubbish, yeah. It sounds like you've really come a long way. I have. I think I've done really well. <laughs> no, we, you do. I mean, from a medical point of view, you look better. Yeah. Your whole condition looks great. You look really alert. But the most important thing is you've now got a balanced, healthy food intake, and that's the number one result from this. Mm. I mean, yeah. two months of no cola equates to about 700 quid. Wow. And have you noticed the bank balance looking better? Uh, it has actually started has to it? look a bit better, yeah, it has. Although they are pleased with her progress to date, Lucy and Shaw know how hard it is to completely break any addiction. Do you think you can carry this on? Oh, definitely. I'm not ever drinking it again, ever. You showed I've, us. I've done it. It was hard, but I'm there and I've done it. I've come through the tunnel. <laughs> you have, and you're, you're looking great, and, you know, I really wish you all the best for the yeah, future. Well done. And Keep it up. Thank you very much. You're a reformed cola-holic. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely going to stay off the cola. I don't ever want to drink it again. And I feel sorry for people that actually still drink it. I don't know the effect that it has or what it can do if you get addicted to it. Um, but I'm never, ever going to drink it again, ever. looking into the potential anti-cancer properties of one of our favourite curry spices, turmeric. Dr Lynn Howells from the University of Leicester is heading up a pioneering study into the effects of one of its main constituents, curcumin, on bowel cancer cells. And she's got something impressive to show me. 
we treated some bowel cancer cells with some curcumin just for 24 hours then we filmed it over the course of two days. We can see that on the, the left hand side these are cells which haven't been treated with curcumin. They're all cancer cells dividing like the clappers whereas the cells on the right hand side they're, they're dying actually because of the, the curcumin treatment. It's a big difference isn't there? Yeah there is. I mean curcumin can clearly in the lab anyway, um, help to prevent uh, in invasion properties of the bowel cancer cells. Are you hopeful that this is going to translate into something good for say you and I potentially in the future? Um, we have a clinical trial running where we're giving patients four capsules of curcumin a day with their chemotherapy uh, and once we know that the doses are safe, the patients tolerate those doses, we can then think about moving on to a bigger phase of the clinical trial I guess it's not just as simple as eating loads of curry laced with turmeric. No, is it really? unfortunately not. You know, it'd be great if it was, but we're still a long way from getting a definitive answer. And that's what the trials are all about. It's actually giving a, a yes or no answer. Is it going to be useful for patients in the future? So in the lab, curcumin is causing cell death in cancer cells as well as inhibiting their growth. Scientists are also investigating whether curcumin can slow the progress of several neurological conditions, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And if the results of these trials in humans replicate those in the lab, and this spice becomes a weapon to fight one of our biggest killers, bowel cancer, then turmeric really is a food hero. Five weeks ago, Ellie from Herefordshire came to the food hospital seeking help for her persistent insomnia. She hadn't had a decent night's sleep for 30 years. Lucy recommended a diet high in carbohydrates in the evenings. Now she wants to find out if it's having any effect. So Ellie, how have you been getting on? Sleep-wise, it's not a cure suddenly. But then I wasn't expecting that because I thought 30 years, I've got to get over the sort of psychological barrier and also the phobia of, of going to bed and going to sleep, yes. which, is, which is a very deep thing. But the difference I have noticed is that where it would take me four or five, maybe even six hours to drop off, mm. several times I've managed to drop off within 40 minutes. And the other difference I've noticed, which is really quite significant is that I don't have or I've almost stopped that sort of adrenaline rush which hits me just as I'm about to drop off and then my body says oh, don't suddenly away don't you've had enough and the other thing is I'm dreaming now I haven't dreamt for years yeah so I'm I'm really thrilled and has anything else changed other than the diet that could account for those uh no, no. no I th the only thing that can have done it is the diet Ellie is not only getting a bit more sleep each night, but is also now confident enough to go to bed without taking any medication. I've, I'm off the pills, which is... Wow. Yes, but that for me is, is brilliant. That is incredible, uh, yeah. because you were taking them every night I for three years. I was taking them every years. night, yes, for three years. If you are on sleeping medication, see your GP before making any changes. Ellie has also embraced Lucy's tip to eat a particular fruit just before bed for its sleep-enhancing properties. I'm hooked on the kiwi fruits, I must admit. <laughs> and they're, they're gorgeous, they're sharp, yeah. and I like that. But they're really tasty and I'm really, yeah, I must admit, kiwi fruits are one of, one of my favourite fruits now and I've never thought of that. I'm really glad that you feel that it's had a positive impact on your sleep and certainly you're looking really well. Mm. So um... I feel a lot better, I feel much more positive and um, much more confident about it and physically I feel great. And you're off the meds? Yeah, yeah. Is... I mean that's fantastic isn't it? Do you know I'm actually really surprised at uh, what Ellie's told me about her sleeping today. I wasn't really expecting that much of an impact. She's had insomnia for 30 years and we haven't made that many significant dramatic changes to her diet so for her to see changes in her sleeping at this stage I think is fairly incredible. So something is working and whether it's just having us as the support network around her or whether it's the high carb meal or the kiwis, time will tell but I, I'm really thrilled that she's noticing changes. Mm. 
Next time on The Food Hospital, we investigate brain-enhancing berries and onions' ability to reduce your risk of heart attack. Meet a crash dieter who's eaten nothing for two weeks. How much of this do you drink a day? About three litres. Three litres? Yeah. Wow. And have Lucy and Shaw wow. met their match when they meet powerlifter Phil? What's the damage on the front? Um, 16 pints of Guinness. What? <laughs>